Howdy, lieutenants and economists. The most volatile, evil, disgusting things on the planet, humans. If you have a video request, you can always go to assholeconsulting.com. Yeah, I am gonna charge you, kids. And that is the importance of not fucking up. You are such an asshole! Hey everybody, old Captain here. We got a video request, and um, <clears throat> it's a short one. A guy sent me uh, a Paul Krugman article, or farcical, uh, Greece's economy is a lesson for Republicans in the U.S. And um, I'll go over this later in a little bit more detail, but you gotta understand, Paul Krugman is just an attack dog. He's, he's not a real economist. Um, he's always ripping on Republicans. Not always rip on the left, but every once in a while, I do some economic research or, or point out something. He, he's, he, it's in the, the New York Times, so we'll address it later. But you cannot view Paul Krugman as an economist, okay? He's, he's a, as I've mentioned before, he's a shill. He's a whore. Uh, he, he, he comes up with excuses and rationalizations so that liberal leftists, especially readers of the New York Times, because they say, hey, I'm excited to say Paul Krugman, so... The sociology majors again. <laughs> so uh, I read through it, and I'm not going to bore you <clears throat> with the, the. You can read it for yourself. It is titled "Greece's Economy as a Lesson for Republicans in the U.S." And and the guy who sent this says, "Are you kidding me? Greece's economy is socialist liberal leftism to the max. They voted in communists. Now Paul Krugman is going to blame it on Republicans." <laughs> <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to su uh, summarize <clears throat> Paul's article. I, I'm not calling him Mr. Krugman or Dr. Krugman because he doesn't deserve it. But he has two general points. Okay, Point number one is that the, the U.S.'s Greece crowd, you know, like we keep predicting collapse and failure here in the United States, <clears throat> and that uh, the, the collapse has not occurred, and that's absolutely 100% correct. However, part of that, and I was part of that crowd, I am still part of that crowd, uh, but what, what kind of ended up uh, mooting or proving you know, uh, everyone who thought the, the collapse and would occur to be wrong is that the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency status, or the world's reserve currency. And I'll explain it again because I know not everyone reads the video, so I apologize if this is a repeat lesson. It's good to have one currency in the world be the default currency that people can go to because for the most part of the 176 nations on this planet, 170 of them are just fucked up. They're just fucked up and their currencies are paper fiat currencies and you don't trust them. So this presents a problem for people who want to store their value, have a liquid currency, have some place to, to park their assets offshore, maintain their value of their investments, and also it provides a standard currency by which to have international trade. Do you want to have your contract written in Zambian dollars or uh, Zimbabwean, sorry, Zimbabwean dollars? Probably not. So after World War II, the United States, because we're pretty much the only fucking nation left, we're like, we're the world's reserve currency. And this was in part because we won, but also in part because we're the only economy that wasn't destroyed or fucked up. And we're the only country that could actually produce the economic value to give our fiat currency, our paper dollars out. Now, of course, it was, it was backed by, it was a partial, uh, partially backed by silver, but only partially. So it was the economic production that gave the U.S. dollar value. So everyone says, yes, we want U.S. dollars, and you see this, quote, dollarization of different world countries. If you go to Jamaica, they will gladly take dollars. Will you take Jamaican dollars here? If you go to Venezuela, they will gladly take dollars. Would you take Venezuelan Bolivars here? So you have to think what that means for the value of the currency. Here in the United States, we produce roughly 30% of the world's GDP, okay? But our currency is validated or accepted almost worldwide. Maybe not totally worldwide, but a lot of countries will take it. Well, did we produce all the production that's in Jamaica? No. Did we produce well, what little production there is in Venezuela? No. Did we produce all the production that's down in South, South America, um, Africa, and all that? No, we don't produce that, that world's GDP. But we still can buy it. In other words, without lifting another finger, without expending another single calorie of energy, <clears throat> we can purchase everything because we have the best currency. So it almost doubles or, or triples 
the value of our currency. It's a really enviable position to be in. Um, it's almost the most powerful, enviable economic position to be in to have the world's reserve currency because now we own, through purchasing, pretty much 70% of the world's GDP even though we only produce 30% of it. So it's like a doubling of, of the purchasing power. Now, the United States economy and our finances have gone down to the point that no one in their right mind would would want U.S. dollars. We have a ton of debt, we run deficits, we have a socialist fuck as president, uh, we have a bunch of lazy fucks who produce less and less and less. We produce less real economic production, uh, we have more services that aren't really tangible, and the argument would be like places like China, Korea, um, even Japan, who produce actual things of real value that their currency should be increasing against the U.S. dollar and that maybe they should become the world's reserve currency or something like that. That would make sense. And there was a fear for that. And in part, the U.S. dollar was going down, gold and silver were going up, except then we have a financial crisis. And you combine that with the fact that there's really no other country that's a, there's no other game in town. No other game. The U.S. is the only one. Sucky as we are, we're still by far the best currency compared against China, the, the yuan, the ruble, Russian ruble, the Brazilian, whatever the fuck it is, I don't know, the Indian um, rupee. These countries, they're growing, don't get me wrong, they do have genuine economic growth, but they're corrupt as fuck. And so, since currency is largely trust, and you got the Chinese who will manipulate their currency, Putin invading Ukraine, and there's all these, that you look at the corruption scores at the Transparency International, you'll see that these countries are corrupt as fuck, and no one trusts them. So this is why, in part, you have the dollar, uh, I'm sorry, not the dollar, gold and silver going down in terms of dollar values, but going up in terms of other currencies' values. So the dollar has been strengthened. You just saw it last week or two weeks ago with the, the Chinese um, stock market crashing and all the government intervention and the hanky-panky and bullshit going on there. Uh, so this world reserve currency... In fact, we have, we can print off gold. It's like being able to weave gold or the goose that laid the golden egg. That's what we got. And we could just print off a ton of fucking money. You want to know why? Because people will buy it. People will lend the U.S. government money because it's a safety thing. They'll actually buy our shitty ass bonds even though we pay jack shit for interest rates and we're debt leveraged to the fucking hilt. Right? Now, if we didn't have that, and this is the whole thing, if we didn't have that, logical common sense would have prevailed. We would have defaulted a long time ago. No one would have lent us fucking money. We would have had to either print off a ton more money and then that money would have been flooded into our own. It would cause hyperinflation, that's recession, or at least a drastic decrease in purchasing power. Or no one would have lent us the money. We wouldn't have printed off money. I'm sure we would have, but let's just say we didn't for economic philosophical debate. And then we would have defaulted and the value of the U.S. dollar and our asses would go down. Say, so, oh, we're not fucking loaning the U.S. They're deadbeats. But we have that world reserve currency, and we can effectively print ourselves because there's there's world demand for it. Right? That is the only thing bailing out faux economists, charlatans, hacks, wannabes like Paul. That's the only reason he could be so glib. Say, well, they're wrong. They're wrong. See, they said in 2009, oh, it didn't happen. Uh, 2010 didn't. Ha yeah, because we have the world's reserve currency. That's the get out of jail free card. If it happened in any other country, traditional economics would have been right. But since we're in bizarro world here with the United States and we're effectively cheating, it allows just 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 charlatans like Paul to to be so sanctimonious, not sanctimonious, hoity toity and holier than thou. Like, see, <laughs> they're obviously wrong. It's it's no it what it's like. Let me show you how assholeish this really is. It's like you're the kid busting your ass off at school, you don't have rich parents, and uh, you want to ask out Amy Sue, and you bust your ass off working at some place at McDonald's or whatever to buy this piece of shit used Ford Escort, and you paid for it all, you and your dad worked on it to get it run up and running again, you got transportation, and you go ask Amy Sue out, and Amy Sue, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going out with Chick McChipperson Thaddeus then than the fourth. And Chip comes by in his fucking brand new, bought and paid for uh, sports beamer that his parents paid for. That's Paul Krugman. 
Okay, that's the cocksucker who relies on daddy government printing them off and bailing them out. And he just gets to be all authoritative. Oh, I see, Bill. You're not a Thaddeus McThaddeus and Sins and Chipper is going to the fourth. Like me. <laughs> I have the superior car. He didn't fucking earn it. He's, it's not his. He got bailed out, just like the bankster scum. Just like the fucking millennials are going to be bailed out of their uh, student loans. So it, it's dishonest. It's intellectual dishonesty to point that this thing hasn't occurred yet when the, the reason is plain as day. We have the world's reserve currency. People keep bailing us out because our currency is the only game in town. So that's... Don't worry. If we didn't have it, we would have... Argentina it happened. See, I mean, and that's the other thing. It's he says, well, we're, it didn't happen to us. It's like, yeah, but it happened to everyone else. Russia, Asian currency crisis, Mexico, eighty-three different times in the seventies and eighties. Argentina, good old fucking mind. I think it's the third time now they're gonna fucking default on their loans. Uh, go ahead, look throughout history. You'll see multiple defaults where people ran up debt, they couldn't afford it, and then they had to default. It, it's just, it's, it's common sense because it's a very simple thing. If you spend more than you make, this isn't even economics. This is the law of physics. You burn more than you consume or than you make, you're going to die out. That system is not sustainable. You burn more calories than you consume. You will starve. You sweat more water than you drink. You will die. It, it, and it, economics are the exact same thing. It's just that we are getting a huge subsidy from the entire world who keep buying our fucking U.S. dollars. I don't under fucking, but I understand it because they're suckier than us even. So that's, that destroys his first argument, okay? Second one. I'm going to read excerpts from it and then kind of summarize. And <laughs> any time uh, Paul could come here and say, oh, I didn't mean that, but I, I think I'm pretty onto it. What turned Greek debt into troubles and a catastrophe was Greece's inability, thanks to the euro, to do what other countries with large debts, large debts usually do. Impose fiscal austerity, yes, but offset it with easy money. In other words, monetary policy, printing off more money. So lowering the interest rate, <clears throat> uh, lowering the reserve requirement ratio, making easier banks to lend, stuff like that. Today, however, Greek debt is over 100% of GDP and still rising. That is because Greece just kept on borrowing? Actually, no. Greece's debt is up only 6% since 2009, although that's partly because it received some debt relief in 2012. All right, so, so it's not sustainable. They are parasitic. This is, even with the bailout, they're still parasitic. It's still not sustainable. People are still not getting their money back. All right, but he's still going to defend it from an economic policy standpoint. Uh, although that's da, 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 da. the main point, however, is that the ratio of GDP of debt to GDP is up because GDP is down more by twenty than twenty percent. Why is GD, GDP down? Largely because of the austerity measures Greece's creditors forced it to impose. All right now, here's the question. This becomes an issue of how. What is GDP? If GDP is actual genuine economic production, you don't have any of this window fallacies like the government pays somebody to dig a ditch and then pays another group of people to refill the ditch, then you get to count both of those expenditures as GDP. Was there any actual genuine economic production? And this becomes the difference between government spending, which is accounted for in GDP, and actual fucking investment. Right? GDP going down in Greece, 20% doesn't matter because that 20% wasn't real economic growth to begin with. It wasn't investment. It wasn't generating income. And what Greece did, and you can try to find their budget, it's hard, but you could find it. What they did with all this my okay, here's a perfect example. Let me give you an example. The Olympics. They spent how many billions on these fucking facilities, all right? And you think that these facilities infrastructure would last more than what is it the month that the Olympics last so that was a decade ago what did they do I think out of the 82 buildings only four are being used well that was a huge boost to GDP back in 2004 did any of that investment whether it's investment in plants equipment businesses things that produce future GDP there there uh, uh, you could say uh, what was the there's two industries uh, Tourism, so they could have built hotels uh, and restaurants, or uh, uh, shipping. Uh, Greece is huge in shipping, like magnets, and shipping containers across the ocean. Did any of that go into ports, harbors, ships in it? No! 
they sank it in there because they they believe in this multiplier effect. They don't realize, hey, this this has got to pay more dividends than just this one month shit of getting tourists in here. Came nowhere near to paying for it. You had this huge misinvestment. So it doesn't matter that the GDP figures going out. The real GDP figures is what is actually producing real consumable uh, utility creating goods and services. And there is so much fat and lard and bullshit fake government spending GDP. Like these these pensions, this government spending on pensions, they think, oh, well, uh, we, we're going to pay. Oh, you overpay these, like, oh, you find multiple articles. But anywhere between 50 to 300 percent more in pay for equivalent public sector work than what the private sector is paying. And the public sector produces fucking nothing, but it still goes on to this. So fuck your GDP argument, Paul. There's no investment. It's all moving money around. Ooh, we borrowed money from the Germans and plop. We gave it to a bunch of fucking government. Gee, GDP growth. Dang, they really grew really fast. GDP shrank because there was no genuine economic production to begin with. It was fake. It was like the U.S. housing bubble. It's all these houses going up, but no one fucking wanted to live in them or could afford them long term. So it was all fake. It didn't happen. Anyway... So continuing on, Greece unfortunately no longer had its own currency when it was forced into a drastic fis fiscal retrenchment. This re result was an economic implosion that ended up making the debt problem even worse. Greece's formula for disaster, in other words, didn't just involve austerity, it involved, toxic it involved the toxic combination of austerity with hard money. So here's Paul's argument. Paul's argument is that austerity, meaning cutting government spending, lowering taxes, or maybe keeping taxes, lowering taxes less than you lower government spending because you need extra surplus to pay off the debt. He's arguing that lowering that government spending would hurt the economy when most of that government spending was wasted anyway. All right? And he's saying if we did that and that the, um, the Greeks could not bail themselves out by printing off more money, inflating in the currency, and just using lower value drachmas, which was their currency before the euro, to pay off uh, these debts. Now they have to use these higher valued euros, which takes more work from the Greeks to get, uh, to pay off these debts. So, so they didn't have the ability to essentially inflate their way out of it. So let's look at Paul's recommendations. And one, to just print off more money. That's a valid solution in Paul's mind. He's like, look, they couldn't print off more money, monetary policy. They just couldn't inflate their way out of it. Oh yeah, because that's worked great every time that's done. Right? Hyperinflation is great. Weimar Republic, Collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, every, uh, what's his name? Jerry Robinson has a great book, The Bankruptcy of Our Nation, and he documents perfectly every notable fiat currency, even going to China and Korea, every notable fiat currency, paper currency, and what happens is they always get hyperinflated away. And then what usually happens, at minimum, at minimum, people lose purchasing power. Uh, but at, typically, the economy collapses and there's economic collapse afterwards. Right? So Paul is thinking that just printing off money is a viable economic solution to this. It's theft. I'm not saying that to be esoteric or to, to make an advanced, complicated economic argument. Printing off money is theft. You and I, we all have a certain amount of money in our bank accounts. The government decides to print off twice the amount of money. Now, guess what? There's twice the amount of money chasing the same amount of goods. Now, our dollar value has been halved. It's been halved. They stole 50%. Now, where do they give the money? Well, they could give it to their government employees, bail out the unions at General Motors, uh, whatever leftist socialist organization, pay the banks. Uh, that they owe the money to. The bank's like, well, fuck you. Thank you for these now half the value drachmas. I know on paper it said you'd owe us 100 billion drachmas, but since you just print them off off of thin air, now they're really effectively only worth 50 billion drachmas. Thank you. We took an effective purchasing power hit, a real hit of 50%. So this is okay in Paul's world. Right? Uh, the other thing, I want to be thorough here, uh, Cutting government spending, oh God, we can't, but again, it's based on the false premise that this was actual going to real economic investments, real productive investments, which it wasn't. The, the, even the socialist, leftist, European Union fucks are saying, you can't have people retiring at 45. You can't pay them those type of pensions. You can't retire at 40. What do you think, we're Italians? What, what's going on? Oh, hey, hey, oh, what, oh where'd that come from? That's even they know that that's laziness and sloth. And sloth. So here's, here's the problem, or here's, here's the, the, the summary 
or the flaw. If you if if you want to play the economics game, if you want to believe, if you want to operate from the premises that Paul, I don't even be think believes in. If you want to believe these premises and up, you want to play the game. Let's argue economics with these rules. Okay, I'll do it with one time, one hand tied behind my back. Paul believes that economic production, real economic growth, real GDP growth comes from government. He's he's as dumb as Nancy Pelosi who thinks that government checks is what keeps the economy going. Right? I, they actually believe printing off money is a viable solution. They don't know that unfortunately the hard they don't believe in taking people and forcing their face into reality saying listen you dumb fucks you got to produce something of value. They believe in manipulating currency. They believe in this hoity-toity ivory tower academia. Never worked a fucking day in the life. Never changed oil. We'll just move money around. We'll just put off more money. You see, we have these policy levers. We we lower the reserve requirement interest rate, and then we 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 increase federal open market operations, and then we uh, buy bonds, and we flood the economy with money, and then we just uh, we'll just lower the federal funds rate. And, Everything will be wonderful, and then that will produce economic production. What they don't realize is the reality is that there's a whole psychological component as well. You have to have, and this is this is why the the we've been doing this in the United States, and even with the world's reserve currency, we've had slow, slow, slothful growth. None of the producers want to produce. Uh, in Greece, I can only imagine what the productive people are saying. You voted in the communist? Fuck that. I'm not slaving away. You need to give people an incentive and hope, and above all else, trust and assurances that you're not going to tax the fuck out of them later on or hyperinflate the currency away. You're going to have standardized rules and laws, and especially laws that respect and enforce and endorse and protect private property rights to get the productive people working again. Paul, you can go and stick your dick in a lever at the Federal Reserve and jack it up and down all you want and put off as much money as you want. The real economy won't grow because, unfortunately, government is not the economy. The central bank is not the economy. It's motherfuckers like me. I'm sorry, I am the face of the real economy. <laughs> I know. We're the ones that produce the shit, and shit is the only thing that gives currency value. First thing I did in my economics class is I had the kids learn what gives, what is economics all about. Money. Business? Huh? It's stuff. It's Sergeant Rumpy Fluffalo. It's my cigars. It's this stapler. It's everything. That's the stuff that gives currency, uh, currency value. Currency is just a tool. But to think that the solution to economic growth is manipulating the currency and this bullshit doublespeak talk of, well, we just uh, we have to put off more money and uh, if we lower government spending and make government workers work, what the fuck will happen? You guys are totally not focusing on what needs to be done. You need to focus on the producers of the world, not the parasites. But, as evidenced by Greece and endorsed by Paul Krugman, we'd rather endorse the parasites. We'd rather vote in communists. We'd rather vote in dipshits who know jack shit about economics. Now, Here's the real thing, and I've mentioned this before. You don't have, don't get your, your, your ire up over Paul Krugman. Paul is a smart guy. Paul won the Clark Medal. Paul did study economics. Paul has done research. I don't believe for a second he believes this bullshit. He's like Ed Schultz. You know Ed Schultz? Ed Schultz is like the biggest, he's like the Rush Limbaugh equivalent on the other side of the left. He's a left-wing talk radio show. You know Ed was a conservative, right? I, uh, I am accusing Paul and Ed of being liars. I, Ed is not a liberal. Ed just found out he could make more money being a liberal talk show host. And if you ever listen to the Ed Schultz show, it's painful. Yeah, we gotta get back to the American worker and then all the fucking uniform. America, America, it's all our dudes. That's, I mean, th listen to the Ed Schultz show. And then read a Paul Krugman article in the New York Times. Paul Krugman, I don't believe for a second, believes the bullshit that comes out of his mouth. You can't, he cannot be this stupid. Which makes it worse if he was stupid, at least he'd be honest. But the fact he's a fucking shill means he's goddamn evil. And his job is to lie and come up with an economic, his, his job, he's paid six figures to go work at the New York Times and tell the New York Times readers who are liberal, give them the economic rationale and reason as to why socialism is great. That's it. That's his job. And then he goes on the television and he, and he talks to the people and all that other stuff. His job is to be the economist of the left. 
which is no different than being a preacher or a pastor, um, even though you don't believe it. You, you just you just lie to keep the church and the faith going. That's it's it's um, what was it? He's like the evil minister or the the vice premier who has the ear of the Lord or the king. Well, your majesty, I don't know. What was it? You see it? You saw it in, what was the cartoon? Aladdin. You saw it in Aladdin. You saw it in uh, Lord of the Rings where the guy, oh, master, and he has him. That's Paul Krugman. He's this slimy, lying sack of shit who doesn't believe it for a second, but that he knows how to make money that way. He's just a, an economic whore. He's just, a, go to back pages. There's Paul Krugman. What do you want me to tell you? I'll rationalize anything economically. So you can't believe it. I don't believe it. Ed Schulte, I listen to it just for humor sometimes because I could predict what conservative talk radio is going to say. But it's the same thing with Ed Schultz. It has zero value. This, it's, okay, another thing. This is like Dr. Oz or Oprah or Phil, Dr. Phil, telling fat women it's all right to be fat, to be body positive and fat. So, oh, fuck diabetes, fuck mor mor uh, morbid obesity, fuck heart attacks, fuck plaque in your artery. Oh, fuck, no, no, you go, girl, big is beautiful. It's lies, don't you guys get it? It's lies. That's what the media does. It tells people what, that's the entire Democrat Socialist Party. Tell people what they want to hear. Oh, you're not poor because you had six kids out of wedlock and you fucked six different guys and they're all different fathers. They're all fucking deadbeats, but they're ripped total dudes and they're fucking bad boys. No, no, it ain't your fault. It's a war on women. See, that's what it is, a war on women. That is their job. And Paul Krugman is just one of the many whores and shills out there telling people what you want to say. The final thing I will point out, is before Paul or any of these other people get too high on their horse. So see, see, look at this, they're wrong. It hasn't collapsed. Gold is going down, so it's going down. Look at the track record of the EU, Japan, and the United States. Abenomics, Obamanomics, uh, George Bush, uh, Keynesian, we'll call it. It's all Keynesian. We've all been running debt and deficits. Uh, we all have debts approaching, if not already above 100% to GDP. And what's happened to economic growth? Here in the United States, again, you can look it up. Look up rolling 20-year average GDP growth. It's a chart I put together. I'm going to say it again. Maybe I'll put it in. Actually, I will. I'll, I'll do a clap, and I'll put it in between. You'll see. This is how I do editing. <laughs> Wasn't that a cool chart, huh? Huh? Yeah. I can divide. I can use my Microsoft Excel. Anyway, uh, that's the track record of Keynesianism. Economic growth is slowing down. These guys are wrong. I, I did a thing called, uh, what was it? How the economics is no longer a profession, how economics is no longer a profession or the shame of the economic. These people don't know what they're doing and you know what, they don't care. They're failures, they don't care. They just want their fucking money, they wanna be paid and then they wanna retire and then they wanna die before the economy collapses or things get too bad for them. And, and you can see for all the chest, we know what we're doing. Ha <laughs> ha, foolish Republicans. Look at what we've been doing. Look at what happened to economic growth. It's been going down as government spending has been going up. Keynesianism doesn't work. Using monetary policy to get the economy going doesn't work. But you know what? No one's going to look up or cat let alone calculate the rolling 20-year average, which is why I'm the world's, well, no, I shouldn't say the world's most awesome, one of the world's most super awesome economic geniuses. That's all. Because I... <laughs> The sad truth is, you don't have to be smart to be a good economist. You just have to be truthful. That's all you have. You just have to be not political. Say, ah, look at the figures. Uh, that's, that's what it is over there. So, Anyway, I hope that explained it. Uh, I hope that's you, you learn not to really, you might as well be listening to The View or, or Dr. Oz or Oprah or anything else on anything of any importance. Because Paul, sadly, whereas he may have had a great economic mind or the potential for an economic he decided to use his skills for evil. Yes, yes, Mr. Well, Obama, you see, the reason that Greece is the revolt of the Republicans is, oh, yes, I see. So, don't listen to him. Go smoke a cigar, have a drink, have sex with pretty big-titted girls. That's all we got. Toodles.